Now, before you go out and build and spend a lot of time building anything, think through the leverage points. Like, what are the kinds of things that are smaller amounts of efforts that could translate to massive scale impact? And sort of prioritize your energy that way. Go go for things that will have, you know, higher, much higher likelihood chance of success. You don't, you know, um, simpler plans, simpler things that would then kind of translate into in, in ripple through lots of networks and lots of people to then cause massive scale impact. So today I have the uh, great honor of speaking with Juan Benet about decentralized science. Uh, Juan is the architect behind Protocol Labs, IPFS, Filecoin, and many other groundbreaking initiatives. And in my opinion, one of the most inspiring creators and intellectuals in technology and science, broadly <laughs> building and advancing some of the most important technologies and scientific efforts. I'm super excited to chat to you today and would be keen to start off with kind of like a bit of a background about um, kind of some of the pivotal moments in your life that got you to engage so deeply in, in science and technology and later to create IPFS and advance so many different scientific and technological initiatives. Uh, first off, thank you so much for the super kind intro. Um, I'm super excited to be here and uh, also very excited to work with you and uh, many other people in the in the community on a ton of these problems. So uh, very excited to talk about them. Awesome. Yeah, I would be excited maybe to kick us off if you could dive into some of your background, um, both on the scientific side and technological side, and how you um, got involved in different scientific initiatives and then later building IPFS and many other technologies. Yeah, totally. So, um, you know, ever since I was a kid, I uh, was really into history and ancient cultures and so on, and I kind of um, I was fascinated by different cultures at different time periods, and I was... Um, I kind of got an, an intuition about um, how long time was by just, you know, making, drawing timelines and so on. And it was just kind of so surprising to me to see so many cultures be around for so long. Um, and then I learned about things that, like the burning of the Library of Alexandria, which uh, has been um, exact, mo much more exaggerated than it actually um, was. It was much more of like a longer term period of loss uh, in, a, in a bunch of places. Um, and in other moments where uh, I just suddenly became fascinated with um, knowledge and, and, and just human progress, I, it was very clear from reading history that as different cultures found out about how to do things, they then harnessed the ability to do those things and then uh, have success and improve their condition. And so um, that, of course, then obviously sounds so simple, but surprisingly, the whole world isn't really organized um, based on that basic fact, um, meaning still so much of our systems and economies and so on are not kind of tuned for that. So anyway, I, I, was, I kind of grew up wanting to learn everything and wanting to learn all kinds of different fields. I was a kind of kid that would um, read encyclopedias for fun and um, I actually started with like really cool illustrated books that would like break out all of the, you know, I think like a, an airplane or a ship or something like that. And, and so I was really into like just learning about every single thing, and I was super curious and, and excited about it. Um, and then further along, um, as I kind of got into things like computers and so on, uh, I started wanting to go into, uh, into computer science and programming and so on, because it seemed like a very high leverage sort of thing. Um, and so I ended up kind of studying computer science uh, at Stanford, and, um, and, but I never kind of like lost the highly multidisciplinary viewpoint that I should just be learning as much as I possibly can about everything. And I always saw it as kind of like a, a painful moment to kind of think about the small number of classes that I could take or the small number of things that I could like learn in a, uh, in, in a moment in time. Um, and so that, for me, was extremely beneficial in thinking about uh, our, our kind of broader knowledge system, like how we learn things, how we get to discover things as a species, how, how we get to connect that to um, technologies that we build to then harness those uh, insights and, and build them and whatnot. And, as I kind of um, learned a lot more about recent history, so you know like the last century or so, um, I started learning a lot about very different kind of environments that produced uh, the great outcomes that we have today, um, and kind of where where those improvements uh, came from. And so these these are things like you know kind of thinking about the downstream impacts of initial discoveries, like um, you know maybe even as early early as electricity and all the electromagnetism work in the in, in the late nineteenth century um, that then led to all of the social improvements uh, that we got, you know, with power and 
um, you know, being able to have light in homes and being able to like power machines and so on. Um, you know, the broader, you know, accelerating the industrial revolution, um, and and kind of thinking about that that outcome. And then after that, of course, like all of the great results in across many sciences, especially physics and so on, in the early 20th century, um, in telecommunications and and, um, and and whatnot. And in that entire um, history, it was extremely special to learn about Silicon Valley. And it, it sort of, I, I, of course, naturally learned a lot about Silicon Valley through being at Stanford and so on. Um, but I sort of had already kind of started to unravel that thread beforehand as part of why I ended up going, um, going there, I suppose, other places. Um, and it was extremely interesting to me that that environment managed to produce not just great scientific results, but translating of technology into products that got um, uh, sold into mass markets and then get, got built out. And so through that, I was able to kind of study the histories of you know, great technology companies like, you know, think of like Apple and the personal computer or um, Intel and, the, and, and even before that, um, Fairchild and, and uh, Shockley and so on. Um, and through thinking about that set of processes is by how I got to learn a lot about how the scientific process really works. Uh, and, and here I think of science not just as the early discovery period, but uh, as also discovering all of the intermediate little concepts and, and things that you need in order to harness some fundamental discovery. So it, it tends to be that science gives the most credit to um, breakthrough results that are very surprising to other scientists, when in reality, the things that end up being transcendentally valuable um, is the broader aggregate set of uh, smaller concepts that couple to one of those breakthrough results that enable us to actually make something out of that result. So if you think about it in terms of like, I don't know, a transistor, um, there's a massive downstream amount of work in figuring out how to make the transistors, how to miniaturize them, how to, what kind of materials to use, what kind of, um, how can you make a process, a process that's extremely um, uh, effective uh, in, in producing them at, at scale with low cost and so on. So it's all of that other knowledge that became, um, that I think is, is uh, at the core of, of true innovation and, and in true scientific discovery, um, because the, you need the discoveries to be able to get all the way into humans' hands uh, to be able to benefit people and then create kind of this self-reinforcing enforcing feedback loop. Um, and through, anyways, through the study of Silicon Valley, I, I got to also study um, other great labs, so things like um, the labs and many other kind of periods in history where some kind of almost magical um, environment got created where uh, some group of scientists and, and builders and engineers and so on um, managed to create these great breakthrough results and, and push them um, and, and sort of push the envelope. Uh, to me, kind of the labs was um, this kind of like uh, unique example of a, a, an extremely highly leveraged group of, of people and systems and organizations that managed to um, out innovate um, the rest of the world, uh, just sort of like by scale, and and they innovated across the entire pipeline, everything from you know early fundamental results like um, things like information theory came out of the labs or um, things like discovering the background uh, CMB, like the cosmic microwave background radiation came from, um, just an accidental uh, discovery in, in, in radio tuning and so on. Um, and of course, all of the kind of important breakthrough, uh, breakthroughs in, in telecommunications and um, wireless networks and cables and um, uh, solar cells and satellites and whatnot. So, so that, that example showed me that there was ways of organizing people and systems and, and um, structures that are just dramatically better than others. And that to me was kind of like the, um, the beginning of a, kind of like a long road of thinking about, hey, what's actually, what's broken about the broader set of systems? Why, why are things um, kind of moving so slow in many areas, um, you know, slow relative to the amount of energy that we put into it when you think about the number of people that are working on those things. Um, and then thinking about ways of like, um, finding those leverage points and trying to, to accelerate things in general. Amazing. I'm curious kind of like on this thread, like there's of course like a lot of also problems for like more like with the current ecosystem probably of like science, but also more broadly things like that. I think the progress studies movement kind of like is uh, framing as just like holding back general economic, scientific, technological progress. And um, I think which go probably even beyond science, like as you mentioned, like engineering, Kind of like technology quite broadly, right? Like, what do you think are some of the 
the underlying reason that like hold back uh, progress like it and like how do you think we could potentially fix them like with decentralized science but also more broadly yeah so so i think um i think there's a lot of different kinds of problems um but my my sense of the biggest problem around is that there is this massive bottleneck in science translation so um i used to think that the biggest problem was things like science funding i used to kind of um, read a lot of papers and do a lot of science myself and, and so on. And I always thought like, oh, you know, there's just so much to discover and we need just a lot more funding um, in kind of discovering more. And, and it's actually incorrect. Um, it, it turns out that um, th that although we certainly need more, more funding and more uh, studies and so on um, to kind of be able to discover more, um, the big problem is not there. It's actually a little bit downstream of that. It's in when you're trying to translate the concepts that you have now thought about and put into a paper and discovered, um, and how you translate those into something that can benefit some other process somewhere else and get connected to some other part of the economy. And the, the reason why that's the biggest problem is that what's preventing scientific discoveries from actually impacting the world is that they, at the end of the day, have to um, uh, translate in some way to some application, right? So, you, so um, learning something is super, learning something new for the species is amazing and fantastic and it's great to be able to discover more about the universe and like there's something extremely beautiful about and, and wonderful about being able to know more of that knowledge. Um, but, but the great value comes from when the entire species is able to leverage that new knowledge um, to do something better and to do something greater than, than we could before. Um, you know, th things like discovering that there were really small microorganisms in our water is what led to germ theory and germ theory was extremely useful and valuable and great to learn about because it enabled us to clean up all of our water to know that it's important to wash our hands to have this massive hy hy hygiene revolution um, that, that enabled just billions of people around the world to survive uh, what otherwise would have been um, really you know unnecessary deaths uh, to, to kind of like lack of knowledge. And so that, um, so to me kind of like the big bottleneck is in how we take our science and our discoveries and we translate them into um, concrete projects and artifacts that could eventually be put into some other set of things like products or systems and, and so on. So this is kind of a, known as a science translation problem. And, and that I think is the biggest issue in the entire, in the entire system. Um, there's of course other kind of broader things that we could talk about, things like um, kind of problems in, in credit, problems in replication, problems in funding, problems in kind of just the rate of innovation and discovery and so on. Uh, but in my sense, like a lot of those things are, uh, are downstream of this bigger problem that even though we are doing an enormous amount of science, most of it is just piling up and kind of being wasted. It's not actually translating into successes down, downstream. Um, and it also, uh, uh, ends up drying funding because agencies and, and uh, philanthropists and many other and technology companies and many other groups that would be funding um, early research or fundamental research um, end up not seeing the results and the impact and so aren't able to continue funding it. And so I think for, you know, embedded in the kind of 21st century where we are, you know, and specifically in 2023, um, we have a global macroeconomic system that requires these strong uh, feedback loops between some activity that you want to do and uh, harnessing value, uh, you know, creating and harnessing value to be able to feed it back into itself. And I think like that's, if we can figure out new, some new ways of funding the area, incentivizing and funding the area downstream of, science, of, of like raw scientific discovery, it's still science, it's still kind of like, it, researchers are required to do this kind of work. It's, it's, um, uh, it, it, it's extremely hard um, discovery work um, but it's not as maybe like highly valued by the scientific community um, in terms of, you know, kind of the big breakthrough discoveries. Um, but it is what I think the m is the most important work to be done, uh, which is how do we take the, the core fundamental things that we've discovered and figure out how to use them in, in, in the whole world. Um. And do you think there's something almost um, like structural about like places, of course, like from the Manhattan Project to the Apollo Project to um, like, like nowadays places like DeepMind or OpenAI that like is almost like a structure advantage which like is missing for just uh, pure for-profit companies 
or pure like academic researchers, like almost something like a flavor in between, of course, with like a, also a lot of the experiments going on that you're involved in uh, from the FAST grants to FROs to a decentralized science also, I think, broadly. Like, do you think there's specific almost like flavor of institutional setup or um, that is necessary and like also like long-term capital, but like still directed and not Yeah, just, absolutely. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think I think that you're very right to call it a kind of like a structural difference. Um, uh, the way I sort of think about it is that think of it as kind of like a like a large scale innovation system that has to meet a certain set of requirements in order to innovate on a, on a particular set of fields in in a at a particular rate. Um, now, of course, you need you know a you need extremely talented uh, scientists that are going to be able to do the thinking and the work and so on. Um, you need a range of um, builders, uh, and this is kind of like a very general wor word, but um, this might include like engineers and uh, tool makers and so on, that are going to be working very closely with the scientists to be able to make better instruments. And as the science is getting figured out, produce the things that, it, that the scientists need in order to make further discoveries. So putting it in terms of like the early maybe quantum mechanics work, um, you know, think of it as like making the cyclotrons or making the, the and, and a lot of this was the scientists themselves, like they're great experimental scientists that, that kind of figured out the, the machinery themselves. But um, this got all really accelerated in the, in the 40s and 50s with things like the Manhattan Project and others, when you coupled like a large um, uh, in more industrialized system of builders to produce the tools and the machinery and so on. Right? If you want to build out something like a nuclear reactor or you want to build um, something like a, like, a, like a space rocket or something like that, um, you need to couple the scientists to the, all of the groups that are going to be building the things the scientists need in order to find things out uh, faster um, and then to kind of like leverage that scientific discovery into something else. So that's, those are two components. On top of that, you need um, long-term oriented capital in, in vast quantities because you know, the, 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 the amounts of people that you need uh, working on this stuff um, is, is very large. Like we're, you know, these places that we've talked about, things like the labs or the Apollo program, or um, even even though that was like less science and it was much more engineering, or um, e even some of the the early um, uh, electricity work um, and going into kind of like power and power plants and so on, uh, we're really talking about like thousands to tens of thousands of people in in kind of like the low end, to hundreds of thousands of people, and so you need tens to hundreds of thousands of people uh, working on this set of things over time, over like a period of five to twenty years. To, a, to achieve those kinds of outcomes. And so that is extremely expensive um, work, uh, exp extremely expensive innovation. So you need pools of capital um, that are able to tackle that scale of work. And you, know, you can do this in two broad ways. One is you can you know, generate these mega pools of capital and kind of like flow them into, into the system. This is kind of the success of the 20th century um, scientific um, programs came from government funding. Uh, uh, allocated at you know massive scale through a set of agencies, um, feeding kind of all parts of the R and D pipeline. Um, you can also do this in in a much more granular way through investment capital. Um, this is kind of like the last half of the 20th century, you, kind of Silicon Valley and VC and and so on. In the early 21st century, is primarily a ton of um, uh, venture capital and um, kind of funding the companies, and then early R and D capital. The sort of couple to that to that venture capital. Um, that's a kind of a nasty. What the nasty problem is, is it's that um, as scientific funding from large scale governments who understood the early parts of the pipeline were extremely valuable, as that funding sort of dried up, um, we haven't figured out a good way to create the incentive structures that enable investment in the early parts of the R and D pipeline. Um, for example, you can't invest in 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 scientific discovery today. You can't like go and um, and, and speculate as an investor into which fields would be great to, will yield phenomenal results, um, because you can't actually connect, say, the early scientific work to the downstream applications and the, and the um, companies and, the, and, the, and the, other, the products being sold to that early discovery. The sort of credit assignment links along the way um, are sort of broken. Uh, you know, the, the traditional um, artifact here to enable that kind of um, investment was the patent system, but the patent system is extremely broken. And it, it only works in, in some specific fields, um, and it's highly, you know, it's sort of like the orders of magnitude there are just way off compared to, you know, the scale of funding that the um, that the that the uh, governments put in 
in the 20th century or the scale of investment for, from um, you know, VC and so on. Uh, and so I think like uh, th that, so, so anyway, capital is like another huge component. You, you, you need great leadership. So, and, and here leadership does not have to be some kind of a centrally planned sort of tree structure, though that definitely can help you go quickly. Um, I really think of it as like, a, 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 you, you need many, many very strong leaders with, um, with kind of vision of what's possible in a kind of five to 20 year time scale. Uh, leading groups, and you want many of those kind of sort of complexes. Um, you don't want to kind of put all your eggs in one basket. Um, all kinds of um, people sort of like uh, end up missing really important uh, things, and, and you sort of like want to be able to do, do that at scale across you know a number of like different questions. Um, often you want to replicate, meaning like you want to um, have multiple groups pursuing similar related questions to be able to innovate faster, um, and and you of course need like a like an extreme kind of open culture where all of the insights are shared as quickly as possible. Um, there's strong peer review that is able to tell whether something works or not. Um, and where you have like very strong alignment in, in sort of like the broader mission of, of doing that, that R&D at, at, at what rate. And I think if you can get those components together um, in those timescales, you can get like these extremely high throughput um, R&D environments. And this is you know, common across a lot of the places that we've mentioned so far. I'm curious like how, how this connects for you to almost like the crypto powered uh, science, like decentralized science um, more broadly and how it fits into kind of your vision also for protocol labs, but also for uh, decentralized science more broadly. And um, kind of also, as you mentioned, for example, this concept of like a crypto uh, powered um, ARPA, which of course is also like one of those successful examples of, of innovation. Like how do you see almost like the vision of decentralized science and protocol labs um, yeah, shaping up in this direction? Yeah, it, yeah, so, so um, the, you know, kind of like, it, it occurred to me like a few years ago that um, crypto systems give you the mechanisms you need to build new incentive structures and new kinds of assets um, that could, that, that, so yeah, let me back up for a moment. So the, the really valuable thing in the crypto world is that it, it's kind of a fundamental innovation in coordination tools. So this means it, it, it's the it's kind of innovation is sort of like law, like the invention of law or like the invention of financial instruments. Um, it, it sort of relates to both of those, but but it's kind of a, a making those computable. And there's a bunch of innovations there around um, solving some really hard problems in in economics around trust and and, and ability to kind of um, uh, coordinate larger groups of people that have mutually distrusting parties um, into into enabling. Uh, certain kinds of coordination. So um, crypto mechanisms give you a programmable environment where you can make these new coordination tools. Those coordination tools could be things like new financial instruments to enable um, kind of investment in the early parts of, uh, parts of R&D. Th those coordination instruments could allow better academic credit structures. They could allow better funding structures to go to things like peer review. Um, they really kind of enable uh, a, 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 an extremely open-ended landscape where you can create all kinds of new mechanisms and so on. Uh, so uh, it's an extremely interesting moment to then look at the older systems and think about what really worked about them and kind of like what, what, uh, what was really special about them and how could you create versions of those or, or new, new things kind of inspired by some of the learnings of the past um, to try and create these much better larger scale R&D environments. And so um, yeah, it, it seems that we can, we, we should be able to build um, funding, not just funding, but like organizations, organizational structures to do this longer term, large scale R&D. And I think it breaks down into a bunch of like interrelated mechanisms. So some mechan you need some mechanisms for funding. Um, you need to be able to have mechanisms that allow um, fund groups that are interested in funding work in certain fields to be able to do that. Uh, you, need, you need to be able to route the funding to the people that are doing the work, uh, the groups and teams that are doing that, that, that work, whether it's they're doing it in terms of getting an, an impact in terms of kind of impactful ROI, or whether they're doing it to kind of like um, create a product that they're selling into a market and creating up some profit somewhere. Um, and you need mechanisms to kind of coordinate large groups of people into doing this work together. So this might be mechanisms around peer review, it might be mechanisms around um, uh, 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 making the artifacts themselves legible. So meaning like uh, being able to uh, attribute credit to all of the papers and the figures and the insights and so on that go into the scientific process. Um, and then you can start coupling all of those objects to things like 
the credit system or the um, or the funding structures or or all of those sort of things. So um, when I sort of like realized this, which was you know I don't know maybe um, ten years ago or so, uh, I kind of like set on a path to build a bunch of those components and then start building a, a, a larger scale environment to do this kind of R and D work. Uh, I initially thought um, that it was kind of going to it was going to sort of follow a more um, traditional sort of path like a like a like a company um, because I again, was very inspired by Silicon Valley style companies or, or Bell Labs, which sort of achieved this as a single organization. Um, but along the way, kind of five, seven, five years or so ago, I started realizing that open networks dramatically outperform central, uh, centralized companies in, in building this kind of R&D innovation, um, especially today with the, um, with the internet. So now that you have the internet, you can, you can greatly outperform um, uh, centralized groups through kind of uh, more decentralized networks um, that, that enable just fast action wherever it's, it's sort of happening. Um, and when I sort of realized that, I started turning Protocol Labs into that kind of network and environment. Uh, so uh, I'm, what I'm sort of trying to, to get to is a, a large scale R&D network that can do innovation across the entire pipeline. So from early scientific work and doing fundamental research um, through the, that scientific translation work to the early stages of R&D to finding applications um, starting to develop those kinds of applications, building the, um, the, the components and systems and products that would enable those applications, and then turning those into products or services that could be sold out into, into the world in some way. And, and doing this through um, an open, permissionless network where anybody should be innovating. Um, and so this means, instead of thinking of it as a, as a single company, think of it as a network of organizations, a network of companies, uh, a network of, of research groups or foundations or, or, or various different entities that interrelate that kind of are broadly aligned with um, that longer term improvement and are focusing on different areas. And so that's kind of where I'm sort of, I'm turning PL into that kind of environment. Um, and you know, key parts of this is leaning into, um, into investment capital as, as one, one part of the structure, because um, that's kind of downstream of the R&D pipeline. You need investment capital to be able to um, have extremely outsized returns in terms of early investments into startups that end up um, uh, creating significant value uh, downstream. And you can take that, those returns from that investment capital um, and, uh, and bring them into the early part of the R&D to do the science work or to do the science translation work that is so underfunded that ends up leading to the, to the um, work that ends up being picked up by startups. Uh, an, an interesting insight here is that um, usually the early science work and the translation work um, ends up usually disconnected from the startups that end up productizing and leveraging the benefit of those discoveries. So this is kind of like a human-oriented um, problem. Um, I think there are some good examples, some good counterexamples of this. So I think things like um, maybe a few companies out there that manage to do the, the entire kind of end-to-end -end pipeline of innovation in some field. Uh, but for the most part, most broader innovation happens in stages across many different organizations, many different teams, many different companies, and so on. So you have to push it from like a, like a network-oriented um, structure to enable the funding of various groups in the early parts of the pipeline, um, the funding of, of various groups at all stages, and especially the funding of startups, when you can find products that can then be, um, have some significant returns in the market to produce some um, uh, you know, large-scale ROI that you can then funnel back into the early parts of the pipeline. So yeah, that's kind of like where, where Procollapse is headed. Um, we already do uh, a lot of this kind of longer term R&D work. Um, there's a number of organizations doing early um, scientific development in, in some fields. Like um, they tend to be like very uh, closely related to the, to the projects and products in, in the pipeline. So this means like early cryptography work or game theory work or um, uh, distributed systems work and so on. Um, uh, but there are even some groups already doing things like um, brain computing interfaces and um, uh, yeah, AI systems and so on in, in kind of air, fields that are like broader and further away from, from crypto cryptography or, or things like that. And a huge fraction of the network is, is startups that are, are you know, building products and selling them into the, uh, into the market in some way because um, uh, that's like the key component to kind of make this a self-reinforcing self -reinforcing system. Uh, my hope is that if we can build some extremely good mechanisms for funding the early parts of the R&D pipeline, governments will actually want to fund this work as well. 
Um, and so we could potentially start connecting the massive pools of capital that are out there for this kind of work to these systems, but I wouldn't count on it. And so we have to kind of build structures that should work and be self-reinforcing and, and regenerative on their own um, and be adaptable and compatible with um, kind of like the other systems that are out there. I'd be super curious if you could explain kind of like for the listener a bit like how you structured protocol labs, like how kind of like this insight from five years ago translated into changes in, in just like the setup of, of how you run protocol labs and kind of like try to create this um, ecosystem and protocol and like also really like how success would look like almost like say in the year 2030, like how, in which direction you would ideally want to take it and like what some of the outcomes might be uh, if protocol labs is successful um, kind of beyond your wildest dreams almost um, in, in, in its structure. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think, um, uh, it, so for the structuring part, um, the, the sort of came, the, the, the biggest sort of like difference is that instead of approaching it as a, as building it, you know, the traditional kind of Silicon Valley approach and the traditional startup approach is to think of it as building one company. You, you think of like, um, creating one company and usually one company tends to orient, um, itself against its strongest revenue flow. It's very rare for companies to have multiple, very strong revenue flows. Um, until they reach some, some, some level of massive scale where they, they just can't kind of grow that one revenue stream and so then they have to start moving laterally. And usually those anyway end up looking like, like groups of companies, right? So the, if you think about like Google um, as one ex recent example, um, it managed to find a, an extremely successful combination of product and, and, and business around search and advertising and grew that massively to massive scale they were able to um, leverage some of that capital to build a whole suite of services around uh, search to, to kind of bring all of the users and get them connected to, the, to that kind of search and advertising business. Or they were able to find other areas where um, some other products with strong advertising potential um, uh, existed, so things like YouTube, uh, you know, they acquired YouTube. Um, and eventually it sort of grew so big that it kind of like, kind of won capitalism in a sense, like they got to like the, the, the biggest scales possible and they were you, 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 these systems kind of can get to a certain level of scale that they just kind of like can't they have to keep up to date and they have to keep re-innovating uh, in case some new um, structure emerges uh, but at that point they sort of like start expanding horizontally and so this is when google started turning into alphabet and things like started investing in other companies and 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 so on but uh, that kind of centralized structure doesn't work nearly as well as an open network so in, in the same kind of time period, there's another group that tried a totally different approach, and this is YC. So Y Combinator is a, um, a, a, an accelerator that just enables startups to, um, uh, to get started. Uh, it's a little bit of funding initially for groups that are kind of trying out an idea, or, or even some later stage companies that, that kind of can benefit from the YC program. Um, there's all kinds of like great knowledge and support that you get from a set of partners. You go through a pretty fast space program. This is like three months, and then you get connected to a large investor network, and you sort of, sort of are off um, to the races. And you you also build a, a network of people that end up advising and helping a lot of the companies along the way. That open network approach um, is a dramatically cheaper than the Google approach if you kind of think about it in terms of uh, scales. But what was very surprising to me, and I kind of went back and, and did this analysis. Um, is that in that in the same time period, period that Google built a ton of products and then built Alphabet and tried to diversify and do these other um, uh, many other kind of companies, um, YC outperformed Google and outperformed Alphabet with a very with a fraction of the cost, uh, and and it did so by creating this great open network where um, great startups being getting started could leverage YC to increase their chances of success and could leverage the YC network to, to um, achieve their success faster. And that more open environment um, created tremendous results across a large swath of fields. And this is not just kind of like the kind of traditional um, purely software um, companies that kind of maybe are more um, the YC stereotype um, or, or even you know, a, a subset of those like SaaS companies and so on. This, is, this includes companies in, in, in space. This, this includes companies doing um, fusion, this includes companies doing quantum computing, like deep tech R&D 
um, a lot of companies doing new kinds of bio, um, drug discovery companies. It, it's just fascinating to see that kind of outcome come out from um, uh, this kind of very straightforward um, program. And so that, that was also extremely useful and inspiring in seeing an alternative um, structure to the, to the, that didn't have kind of like the, the problems of the, of, the, of the sort of single company approach. So going back to Protocol Labs, uh, Protocol Labs is um, oriented now much more towards the YC version of the world. Um, but while YC kind of looks at it as one stage, um, PL sort of look at, looks at it as the entire full pipeline. And we want to think of like um, specific programs, different kinds of programs at different kinds of stages. And so we're sort of organized as a, as a, as a network of companies. Um, some companies are investment funds that fund um, development at various different stages, either um, you know, startups in later stage or um, impact capital funds that are funding kind of grants and FROs and um, you know, early teams doing kind of this translation work. Um, FROs are focused research organizations, which are groups that are um, uh, there's kind of an invention from Adam Baldestone, who's another great innovator in this in this um, um, in, in, in this space, where um, he realized that you could uh, gra like take a group of scientists and enable them to do that scientific translation work that's so necessary by by creating a vehicle to fund that work with the goal of that vehicle just to achieve those results. Um, and so he's been able to to scale a, a set of projects that you know pretty massive. We're, we're talking, you know, in the like fairly large scale in, in terms of funding and, and numbers of scientists and so on um, to be able to do those those sort of translation projects. Um, so anyway, um, those kinds of systems are kind of like part of this universe of, of of entities. And so if we can kind of get strong ROI out of the the downstream pipeline, we can kind of then keep doing funding the early stages of R and D and sort of keep going. Um, and so yeah, that's kind of we're structured as a as a network of companies and. Um, I'm still thinking through what are the kinds of systems that you need to build into this network that can um, make it very strongly self-reinforcing. Like, what are the things that bring all of these groups together? Um, I think there's a lot of low-hanging fruit there in, in ways of creating um, mechanisms and systems that can enable groups to collaborate more. And, and how do you build like a, like a great, large-scale, open culture? So one of the great things about all these labs that we've been talking about um, was that they had an amazing R and D culture? Um, you know, you know, Bell Labs had had its own journals and had you know the, the ability to, like um, they had seminars and had classes and had um, uh, lots of discussions uh, that enabled like lots of groups to 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 think through a lot of this. Think think of universities too, uh, similar kind of um, kind of environment. Um, and you need that across all these stages in the pipeline. You don't need that just in the early stages of early research work, you need that in kind of like the translation work too. You need that in the, when you're building products and so on. So I'm thinking of how do we build those kinds of structures of that great research um, and engineering culture or, or research and development culture um, and do it in an open environment in, in an open way where, you know, any participant across this network can, can sort of um, uh, partake in, the, in that kind of, that kind of culture. So there's all kinds of systems and structures that are, that are still to be built out. Um, and I'm pretty excited to, to go, do, go do that. In terms of like, the impact and a longer term scale of you know, what, what we could do, I think like, if, we can, if we can kind of like meaningfully open the R&D bottleneck um, and we, we can figure out what set of mechanisms can enable that and, and just are able to scale it, that to me seems like an extremely high leveraged way of then accelerating a lot of other environments and a lot of other fields. So um, at that point we can start, you know, if we can do this well in, in, in computing, um, uh, then we can kind of start looking at a set of other fields and, and being able to do that there um, to accelerate many many other environments. Um, I do think also in you know we work on computing because we think that some of the most important breakthroughs for humanity are going to come from computing. So again, things like AI, things like brain machine interfaces, things like um, new mediums like AR and VR, uh, and of course crypto and and, and so on. I'm curious, like, how you squared is almost like in this direction of which outcomes and almost like metrics you want to achieve and, and like how you almost like expand the uh, vision probably like over time from having created it. Like, like, how do you keep it kind of like cohesive under specific uh, outcomes you want to achieve without like being struck by a good hat's law and over optimizing kind of like a metric like a lot of big tech companies probably um, yeah. like struggle it with? Look, it's an extremely hard question. So m m 
to date, most of our attention has gone to, um, you know, when I think about like all of, um, all of Protocol Labs and like most of the groups in it, most of the attention from most of the groups has gone to IPFS and Filecoin, which are two specific projects. Um, and there's a lot of teams building that tech and a lot of teams building um, products on top of them and, and building you know, core developers in, the, in those groups or um, you know, startups building on IPFS or startups building on, on Filecoin and so on. And, um, and that, I think that's part of a nat the nature of how the R&D pipeline works, where, you, where, where um, a small amount of work in the early parts of the pipeline ends up producing an enormous amount of work in the later parts of the pipeline. And we need to be very coupled to large scale revenue flows out from those startups um, that will then enable the, the rest of the system to operate. So um, to your point of like, how do you avoid sort of like getting, um, getting distracted is like, well, first off, you, you, need, you need the entire system to sort of work. And so you, that, from there, you need like strong revenue flows in the, in, the entire, in the entire thing. And that should come from like whatever startups can, can be like, you know, very successful. Um, the second point there is that um, teams should be highly focused on the thing that they're doing. So that means if there's a specific group, a specific company or a specific team working on a specific thing, they should be highly focused on the particular product that they're building, the particular um, uh, uh, service that they're making or the technology they're developing or the research that they're doing and so on. Um, and so you can get like, you, you can avoid the, the problems of distraction by, uh, by making sure that the, all the various teams are like, you know, sort of like highly focused on those things. And we benefit a lot from, you know, as a community, we benefit a lot from um, the the fact that like startups tend to be like highly focused environments that that are going um, in that direction. And the same goes for research groups. Research groups tend to be like highly focused on a specific set of questions that they're going after, and and, and so on. Um, and and so yeah, I think I think it, um, we're we're able to to um, uh, to kind of like grow in that way. Um, to your point about like KPIs and objectives and goals, um, yeah, there's something that I've been um, I've been working on recently. Um, I think that there there is um, you know, a few of, a few of us are working on this. Um, there's a possibility of creating a network oriented version of OKRs um, and a way of measuring KPIs in a public setting between a large group of kind of um, related entities that may not be you know the same company or whatever. Um, and you can create these indicators broadly and publish them, uh, and you can create these goals and you know you, you run a kind of like a, a group oriented process that can figure out what these goals should be. Um, and you just publish those and you keep reporting those. And over time, they'll have an effect of orienting um, uh, lots of groups to solve those problems in general. I mean, at the end of the day, you can think of this as like governments and, and, and nation states. You know, nation states measure uh, all kinds of things about themselves and, and their systems, you know, the, the well-being of people, um, things like GDP, things like um, security and safety, th like all, you know, the, whether or not like basic systems and basic infrastructure works. Um, and then, you know, there's a whole set of objectives associated with like achieving progress and a bunch of those things. And so think of like building that kind of system out of a network of, out of a network of companies. And this is one of the things, the things that, um, I think, uh, many innovators in, in, in the startup world today, don't think big enough in the sense that like, uh, you, you really should be starting to think, think about the potential of the, using the internet as coordination tools for massive scale reorganization. So this means. Um, you know, making things like countries, making things like nations, uh, you know, sort of like the um, uh, things like the network state or coordinations and, and so on, like the, things of that sort. Um, or crypto networks, I think, are much more, um, crypto networks are really interesting. And in I think they're much closer to countries than they are to kind of other systems like um, um, economies or, or, or corporations or things like that. They're, they're, they're like a, um, an, a type of entity that that it like transcends you know any any kind of like individual group. It's 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 really kind of a kind of like a nation because it has it has an, it tends to have an economy, it tends to have many participants, and it tends to have many um, many groups. It's just a very different kind of environment that um, that just operates uh, you know in in an entire virtual world, um, and it's not it's sort of connected to the real world, world through the internet, but it doesn't have a location or a place or something like that. And I think so far, um, you know, we tend to like. This is another thing, like, 
the, the sort of crypto economies are of such scale that they exceed many countries, um, and and so they're they're kind of like that scale of thing, not not um, not things like corporations. I'm I'm curious how you see this almost like relating to the broader um, scientific realm of like what are maybe like some of the like most interesting for you kind of like scientific outcomes and like more broadly like technological engineering outcomes that you would like to achieve like of course with protocol apps but also would like uh, decentralized science broadly to achieve and and aim for like some of the maybe like most ambitious DeSci project ideas uh, you kind of like are working on and or would like to see build yeah so um Maybe I'll start with um, some of the, the like larger types of fields, and then kind of back into the smaller scale things because I think it's yeah. the smaller scale. Smaller scale things are the things that give you the bigger scale things. So I think broadly, humanity is um, needs to advance a lot of field. First of all, we need to advance every field in every direction, and so on. Um, and so my statement should not be like, uh, "Hey, we should only focus on a few things." We need to do all kinds of improvements everywhere. Um, but I think the areas that are most underserved right now that I think could produce massive impact downstream of discoveries, so extremely highly leveraged areas of work, um, I think are things like, well, naturally, like some frontiers of computing, so things like, again, bring computer interfaces, AI, um, but also things like nanotechnology. Uh, I think if we can, could get to things like atomically precise manufacturing, the, the whole world would change very quickly. Um, if we can get to, um, I, I think there are a set of like, um, kind of taboo sciences that um, a lot of the world has um, tends not to uh, work on because of like kind of dumb reasons along the way where um, a set of people didn't want to do that work or, or thought that um, work shouldn't happen and they sort of created like a like a um, a, a negative incentive in, in, in systems to to pursue that work. Um, I think longevity is a good example of this. Um, I think, thankfully, that has really changed recently. I think that the whole world is a lot more um, uh, aligned with, hey, wanting to live healthier lives and wanting to extend healthy lifespan and so on. Um, uh, things like, I think another kind of interesting taboo science is um, uh, is cryo. So cryo it tends to be seen as, as um, science fiction and... Uh, and 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 so on. And when in reality, um, it's a you know very concrete, solvable problem, a, a core scientific problem, and a core technology problem. Um, and and one that's I think tremendously important to society. When when you think about like um, when it, th there's this like yeah, sorry, I'll take a detour slightly in, into this field because it's it's super interesting. So there's there's this um, with, with with most things in health um, that science has been able to. To, to help cure or help solve or something, um, there usually is this kind of curve of improvement where as we learn something about that disease or that problem, we start coming up with improvements along the way and we start being able to treat uh, people and improve um, their outcomes and eventually potentially completely cure something. And that curve um, means that uh, there's a period of time after which people born in that moment will no longer suffer from that, that sort of illness. Or, um, and, and in many cases, these, these time periods are like, you know, five to 30 years. Like somebody born 30 years after something, uh, after the, 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 the great R&D in that field started, will n not have to suffer greatly from that, that, that thing. And, you know, even though at the time of their birth, maybe um, tons of people die of that thing, then maybe later on, um, uh, by the time they're, you know, adults or whatever, um, that is a totally treatable thing. So, so that means that there's a whole, a huge number of people that suffer from those problems that often die in that intervening time um, that kind of have like this unfortunate death sentence because the R&D isn't going to happen fast enough. And, you know, this affects hundreds of millions to billions of people on the planet. Like some of the leading causes of death are things like um, cardiovascular disease or cancer or these other um, things that should be um, treatable, should be preventable, should be addressable. Um, and of course, you know, the broader kind of degradation of the body and so on. So we really need something like medical time travel where you should be able to kind of uh, pause, hit pause in your like life clock and then resume when the diseases are curable. And, and that I think is like 
um, a, a massive moral imperative for the world. Like I, th I think that the in, the world should be developing uh, cryo tools to be able to um, enable hundreds of millions of billions of people to survive these like extremely tragic events um, when all they did wrong was like be born in the wrong year, right? Like it, it's just kind of this horrible, horrible sort of outcome. And you know, I sort of think that we could have had cryo already. It's just that it became this taboo science um, uh, that unfortunately didn't, um, uh, you know, a group of people that didn't want it to develop managed to kind of um, create a, a very negative incentive in, in, in the academic fields um, uh, for anybody kind of a publishing or trying to think about doing experiments there and so on. So I think like, that's a big bottleneck. Um, and th th that kind of bottleneck, same sort of thing, appears in a lot of other places in science and, and in R&D. And if we could just sort of like um, get rid of those taboos and, and enable longer term R&D work to happen um, and really connect it to the outcomes, uh, I think we'd be in a totally different place. I, th I think this is the same with like um, gene editing. So I think like today, um, most scientists in that area of the field are naturally very um, hesitant and concerned because of the great potential for harm that can come from gene editing, right? Like you can get in things like engineer pandemics and you start shifting what the species is and so on. Um, and at the same time, by not advancing that work, we're dooming billions of people to die and we're dooming billions of people to not have access to a much greater version of themselves. So I think this is like something that has to, um, has to radically change about how we approach um, scientific inquiry and, and how we approach technology development. We have to be, um, we, we have to evolve the, the, the structures to be able to do that kind of long-term work without, um, w without sort of like holding it back because we are too, we're, we're, because we're too scared. Um, I think mo we, we, we tend to kind of, this is kind of like the trolley problem. We, we, humans in general tend to be okay with great harms happening because they didn't directly cause it. And they don't really tend to think of um, the harm as something that we as a group should be working on preventing and, and stopping and so on. So I think like those, that kind of, um, th there should be a significant shift there. And I think this is where DSI specifically could have an impact because DSI could create the environments where that, those kinds of um, sciences could get funded. So a very concrete example, um, uh, the impetus grants, which is a, a fast grants program for uh, grants and longevity, started out of a discussion about this kind of problem and the fact that there didn't exist good funding structures for longevity. And um, that then we realized, damn it, we should just create a, a small pool of capital that could start doing that early funding work. And that will create an, an avenue and an outlet for so many scientists to be able to do that really valuable and important work to then kind of um, push the frontier uh, and so on. And that mechanism was just a straightforward grants program that approached things differently. That had that was not kind of stuck in the in, in the in the um, uh, more uh, centralized parts of grant funding in in science. So, so so I think many more smaller pools of capital will greatly help a lot of science advance faster. Uh, this is where I think things like experiment.com, which were um, which were uh, early attempts at this kind of thing of like democratizing science funding. We need more experiments like that because. Um, I think that one in particular, there was something about kind of the transaction type or transaction size and so on that didn't quite work. I, I think we probably need to look at things like, you know, raising somewhere between like five to thirty million dollars worth of grant funding for a very specific narrow field, um, and be able to connect the people interested in outcomes in that field to the people doing the research work in that in that field. So I think this is where I think a lot of DSI improvements could could ena enable us. Um, so now kind of speaking about the, the kind of like smaller things that I think are where, where people should be creating a lot of improvements, um, it's in building the mechanisms and the tools to do that sort of work. So this means better funding structures for science, better funding structures for R&D, ways of making um, the early R&D work more profitable. So fixing the profit structure there. Uh, one of the things that I'm super excited about what you're doing is like helping fix the entire IP transaction space. Like the that is the, the core incentive field that is supposed to sit between academic credit and kind of the selling things, selling products into the market. 
And that incentive field is totally broken. It doesn't really produce a lot of innovation. How many scientists do you know out there or, or researchers who say, oh, I don't have to worry about grant funding because I discovered a bunch of things and I have a bunch of patents and I live off of that off of patents. You know, probably zero, right? Like, or, or very close to zero. Like, there might be some like very su successful people out there, but it, but close to zero. And and so I think like better mechanisms in that part of the system can have an extremely highly leveraged outcome in in um in, in improving the entire the entire pipeline. Uh, there's also other simpler stuff, simple things like enabling better notions of academic credit um, and be able to flow funding to academic credit. So one concrete idea here that, that I think is like pretty straightforward. Um, you could take the you could take all the papers in the world and look at the authors and the references, and you can build the network of academic credit by you know creating a you know a single neuron that connects that paper to the people that wrote that paper and the other papers that uh, influence that paper. And that way you can build like this massive network of of all of the um, of all of the papers that have been written so far. And you connect it to the data and figures and whatever other artifacts. Like you shouldn't just say, oh, only specific types of scientific discovery formatted in a specific way. Like you should be able to be open in, in, in connecting. And then you can sort of eventually start setting the weights of credit there because you know not every paper influenced the, the other paper the same way. The authors probably could arrive at a pretty good credit and, ref, and credit distribution for themselves and for the papers, uh, for the references. And out of that, you could create like this massive network of, of credit that wires up all of science. And the next thing you do is just you, you start pouring money through it. You, you start at like one end and you start pouring money to the discoveries that influenced and impacted things that ended up getting developed. And so I think something like this is like achievable by a group of five people, I think. Um, uh, you, you know, I think yes. somewhere between one and five people can build something like this and, and you could have massive impact. Um, yeah, there's actually um, exactly this kind of was built uh, called like the Emerant Prize by James Fickle and others kind of like retroactively rewarding like the most impactful longevity papers and kind of like all the influencing authors. So it's a cool project. And um, well, and actually at DC Berlin, we have a uh, cryo out speak for Emil who, who basically also t together with me and many others like is trying to bring crypto capital into advancing crowd. But I'm curious because I think it's touching on a really interesting point of almost like the Overton window within crypto is different than outside of crypto. Like I think Nadia Asparova, I'm probably um, pronouncing her name wrong, but like um, who I think also worked with Protocol Labs, did this nice piece on science funding and, and kind of like how the tech uh, wealth effect kind of like shifted science funding. And I think of course like a similar phenomenon is happening with crypto where like even the earliest pioneers from uh, Hal Finney to um, Ralph Merkel were like really advancing and, and supporting uh, cryo, for example, right? And um, I, th I think I'm curious what your thought is on like almost like in that sense that crypto seems to be early in, in terms of like uh, before big overturn shifts in what seems um, yeah reasonable to fund, which scientific field seems reasonable to fund, to, to be on the frontier of that. And um, if there's specific almost like high levers to uh, increase also the amount of people, for example, within crypto, aware of these scientific fields and and excited to to advance them. And of course, like the mechanisms for them to participate, right? Yeah, so I'm curious. Like, yeah, so, specific levers there. So I think so. so I think you're, you're right that uh, crypto has enabled a lot of funding to go to things much more directly and visibly than before. And and I think um, and I don't know if that's 100% true uh, in that if you, I, I think unfortunately a lot of the funding flows are hidden because of this Overton window style problem. So I think a lot of the funders, like if, if you go through, I don't know, like um, the top funders in various fields, um, underneath the hood you'll likely find connections to all sorts of um, people who might want to be hiding that connection because the Overton window is not open in that, in, in wherever they are. And so I think it's kind of like a, like a a benefit to crypto that because crypto is not so mainstream, and I think it's because of also the time period. I think the 2020s are way more socially fragmented than, say, the early 2000s. So I think in the early 2000s, um, beca because media was much more centralized, um, Overton windows either opened or closed altogether, right? So if you, if you think of like you know, the extreme version of this is kind of the height of the Cold War, where there were basically two stories at any one point in time, right? Like the, 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 the West capitalist story and the Soviet, the, the, the Eastern Soviet 
story. And everything had to sort of like closely connect to that. And so overtime windows couldn't be opened quickly on things unless they were extremely important to the top goals in, in either of those, those camps. Um, I think that um, as media got decentralized through the end of the 20th century and early 21st century, and, and as it got like super fragmented through social media, we now created a much faster way of opening Overton windows in a bunch of areas. And so I think, I think that has been tremendously beneficial. My favorite example of this is just how fast um, uh, brain machine interfaces got opened up. Like we went, it was basically a period of like maybe two or three years of going from people thinking this is like absolutely crazy, like science fiction realm stuff to um, people signing up for Neuralink, right? Like it, it was like two or three years. And I think this is where um, you can open over the Overton window um, by being very strategic in what you, what you do. I, I think I encourage people to go back and like study what Elon did uh, and what other people in that field did in those two, intervening two, three, two or three years to open up the Overton window. You can spot at least four to five, six, four, four to five moments where they introduced some of those ideas and, and gave time for absorption. And just every, at every moment, it kind of like it sort of like opened up more and more and more. And so I think we're in an environment where we can, we can open up Overton windows very quickly on certain things. Um, I think you, you are right, though, that like um, at least very visibly, a lot of crypto money is flowing into all of these kind of more controversial sciences. And I think it has to do with like um, the fact that crypto has been so controversial already that if you if you if you're around in crypto, you're like okay with the controversy. You're okay being associated with and visibly um, with with a lot of this kind of more frontier type of stuff that, that hasn't yet kind of fully opened. Um, and so, but, but I don't know in terms of like actual amounts, um, how it relates. There's, there's another part of this, which is, um, I think the, there's kind of like a generational thing here where if you look at most of the governments in the world, they're kind of run by the baby boomers and the thinking in the, in, in that generation has kind of like not kept pace with where sort of millennials and, and sort of Gen Z are going. And, and to the extent that like, you know, these broad categories like millennial and Gen Z apply worldwide, right? Like every, every country is very different and, and the generations there are like substantially different than what they want to do. Um, but but I, I really think that you know, once you have countries that are um, kind of run by like Gen Xers or millennials, a, a very different type of environment is going to emerge. Uh, because these are sort of generations that grew up with the internet and, and grew up with a very different kind of information flow and, and information acquisition flow. Um, and so my sense is that a lot of things are going to accelerate pretty fast. Um, and all this is setting aside the fact that like, you know, AI might totally rewrite a lot of <laughs> what we're talking about anyway um, fairly quickly. So, so yeah, I think, I think it's like, pretty exciting. It's just kind of a matter of like sort of getting there and navigating the, the landscape well so that you know, we, <laughs> uh, we, we do in fact make it. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious, like um, shifting into almost like the topics of like AI and the, and the longer term future, like how, like what types of almost progress do you consider most critical for humanity's future? And um, and also like how AI relates to them, like like almost like how you see it play out and also integrate with some of the other projects uh, you're involved in, right? Like protocol, the uh, website is protocol.ai, right? So I'm, I'm um, curious in the connection you yeah. see almost between protocols and AI, but also in... in just like how fragile the future is going to be and, and which role yeah. kind of like AI is playing there. You know, I think in you know, 2023, this is kind of after GPT-4, so a lot of people in the world have already kind of had their awareness moment of realizing just how close um, AGI is. Um, I kind of had versions of that moment five, ten years ago. Um, for me, the bigger wake-up calls were around like the early DeepMind results, um, like the game playing results. Uh, things like Alpha Zero and and um, and especially Alpha Star to me was a, a big warning shot of what's to come. Uh, Alpha Star is the model that was able to beat world champions in StarCraft. Um, because unlike the kind of like very concrete and clear um, game that chess or go are starcraft is a is a is a game with much higher dimensionality and very different goal sets you know you have to maintain an economy you have to like coordinate a group of units you have to like 
decide strategies of attacking or defending at various moments. You have to progress a, a tech tree. Um, that to me is the fact that it did so well um, so early uh, is an example of the massive rewriting that we are about to experience. Um, and, it, and the fact that it's a lot closer than, than I think what most people think. Um, I've always thought that AI would be kind of one of the most important, if not the most important things for humanity to ever make um, or to invent. Um, we are in a, in a moment where we are truly building um, another intelligent species. And that is, when exactly that happens and when we do it, um, has deep implications on our, on our likelihood of success and, and survival. Um, if we do it well and we can kind of um, uh, smoothly upgrade humanity alongside as we build AI systems and AGI and so on, then humanity itself is going to become a, some kind of digital um, species. Uh, maybe not immediately, but eventually once you're able to kind of measure the brain and virtualize a human. Um, and once you virtualize a human, you can start like refactoring a human and, and changing what a human means. And so like the entire cosmic future, it has an enormous amount of potential for us if we, if we sort of make it. Um, and at the same time, um, there are versions of the pathways ahead where if we make an AGI fast enough or reckless enough, recklessly enough, um, that we end up with a, a, a misaligned AGI system, um, then we are unlikely to make it. Um, I think the the problem space here is extremely tricky, um, and you know I, I think there are extremely good treatments of it uh, out there. I think I highly recommend folks to um, go read the you know many extensive um, uh, documents and letters about this, um, and especially you know recently I think in the last year there's been a lot of really good writing about this and, and, and really good discussions on it. Um, you know, funny, a funny anecdote, uh, uh, apparently, so in, in, uh, in Turing's Cathedral, which is a, a book by uh, George Dyson, who's related to Freeman and, and, and Nestor, um, uh, he tells the story of apparently von Neumann uh, realized that computers were going to end up accelerating uh, and, and recursively self-improving. Uh, in terms of improving technologically and then eventually building thinking systems. And apparently he had like one night where he spoke to, um, to his wife uh, and, you know, kind of like was raving about like the coming um, problem that, you know, intelligent machines was going to wreck on, on the world. And he was his own version of kind of coming to terms with the kind of like the, the moment in which um, uh, computing machines would sort of like overtake humans. I think that kind of hope... Um, all along the way since, you know, the early Turing pieces on this and uh, um, and so on, would be that as we build, build AGI systems, they sort of become like our, our um, either our, like a great moral intelligent beings, uh, which would be kind of like a successor children species, um, or we create uh, augmentation to humans, and so we just become part of the AGI uh, line. Um, and I think that's sort of, those are like the outcomes worth uh, shooting for. I think the second one is likely, you know, favors humanity. The former one is um, uh, likely to happen anyway, eventually. Um, but I think it's very possible that we accidentally kill ourselves along the way, that we accidentally make a system that will wipe out the species. And I think that this is one of the things that is under underappreciated by a lot of a lot of people right now. Um, and I, I think it's getting a lot better. I mean, I think today, these days, um, you can talk about AGI risk uh, publicly and so on, and people, you know, there's sure a set of people that disagree with that and, and whatnot. But I remember when, you know, 10, 15 years ago, um, you know, when I was at Stanford, I, w I went to talk to the uh, chair of, this, uh, of the AI department at the time uh, and you know, about AGI and uh, AI systems and when this would happen. And, you know, at the time, it was super... This is right before deep learning, so the outlook was very grim, and the perspective was that AGI wouldn't come for, uh, for you know, the faculty at the time was that AGI wouldn't happen for hundreds of years, if not ever. And and to me, as a student in computer science, that to me seemed baffling. Like, how could the faculty of the 
AI department uh, at Stanford think that, <laughs> given given just like how clearly, obviously, um, uh, you you can think about the information theory, um, uh, you, you can think of the, what the brain does in terms of information theory and the processing that the brain is doing, and you can think about how to replicate that sort of system. You can, of course, predict that at some point humanity will be able to create something like that, um, and so. Uh, and, and the fact that, like, you know, if you look at computing in, in, in 80 years, it's totally transformed the planet. Like, we've gone from early mainframes into, you know, massive intercommunication networks, um, uh, telecom everywhere, um, and, you know, superpowers, software superpowers that we can, like, summon through our phones and, and whatnot. So I think this is a lot closer than people may realize. I, I think it's good that now it's a lot more possible to talk about this um, publicly, and it's good that the broad community is, is trying to come to grips with whether or not this is like two to five years away or 20 to 50 years away because kind of the strategies are very different um, depending on kind of what you what you think. Um, I personally think it's a lot closer. I, th I personally think it's like I'd be at this point I would kind of be surprised if we don't don't uh, if, if we couldn't build an AGI by 2030. Um, I think thankfully a lot of labs have slowed down and, and are proceeding much more cautiously which is great. Um, uh, some aren't, which is a problem. Um, and I think uh, it's really good that, in general, the broader field is kind of like pumping the brakes a bit. Uh, so I think we're in a better position today than we were a, one year ago. Um, but yeah, hopefully, we, hopefully we'll make it. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious uh, how you see almost like the future with AGI, but also the risks intersect with, with crypto, like decentralized networks and, and science more broadly. Because, of course, like, a lot of you are worried like for like AGI to run on like trustless substrate that you can't shut down all that like it's autonomous and yeah. um and and very hard to tame. And especially of course also for some of the scientific risks, right? Like from bio risks to other things that, that AGI might have like an easier time on like a trustless scientific infrastructure to execute than on a um more yeah, like well preserved. Yeah, look I, I think it's um you know I I come from a very strong open source background and open networks background. So for me, I, um, as a student of history, and um, I have strong preference for and bias towards uh, large scale open systems, permissionlessness, um, you know, strong protections to to enable like a, a large pl plural um, democratic sort of environment. Um, and despite that, when I think about the risks with AI systems, um, I can't think of a more, um, you know, kind of like an easier, easier way to get to your AGI if you build like massive supercomputing clusters that nobody can shut down. Um, and so I think that, that uh, um, and sorry, the fastest way to get to like bad AGI um, uh, than, you know, if you do that. Uh, and so I think that the people that are doing AI and crypto today um, need to be built thinking about the risk structures completely and need to be building those networks with me safety mechanisms in place. Um, I tend to think of it kind of like the other way, actually. I think, I think crypto systems are going to enable us to um, figure out the provenance of what goes into a model. Like, they're going to enable us to think through what is, what is, what is, the, um, what is the model, what is the algorithm that was used to train the thing. What is the data that went into this thing? What is the model currently saying about various kind of inputs? And you're going to be able to kind of reason about um, invoking those models with a good understanding of kind of like what, what went into it. And so what's like the likely thing that you could get out of it? <clears throat> and I think like you could build kind of um, things like LLMs or, or generative AI type of systems that take into account all that provenance and take into account um, how to make that, th th those systems much more aligned. Um, I think. I think a lot more of the AI crypto community thinks this way than people realize. I think a lot of people think that the AI crypto community is just a bunch of cowboys that are like yoloing their way into like um, uh, uh, just like <laughs> AGI death or whatever. And, and I don't think that's true. I think I think they, they actually are a lot smarter about about this than they're given credit for. Um, I think they are. I think a lot of groups are legitimately concerned that the regulatory stru structures that are getting proposed will inhibit small open source work or will inhibit um, uh, open innovation and might grant like these massive monopolies to, you know, things like OpenAI or DeepMind or whatever. Um, and I think, you know, it's a legitimate concern. I think we should be, we should be wary of it. 
Um, but it's also not such a big concern that like we can't kind of try things out in some direction and then go from there. Um, you know, part of the successes here with nuclear is that we managed to be in a structure where like you can't really go and build a nuclear uh, device uh, without people in, around the world finding out and and stopping you from causing some like ma major harm. Um, this is not the case for engineer engineered pandemics today. Like you could, we, we are getting. Um, surprisingly close to the moments where like small labs would, would actually be able to um, design new kinds of viruses and so on and, and sort of print them and, and distribute them around the world and whatnot. Um, and, and that one's a lot harder to police because unlike nuclear, like you, it, it's much harder to detect. Um, and so I think like AI is, um, you know, I think a regulatory structure could get us closer to the nuclear environment, but AI is gonna be a lot more like pandemics where um, it's just way harder to kind of like regulate how, how it's gonna happen. Um, especially because of the, just like the basic um, acceleration of, of hardware. So, you know, Moore's law and, and related laws just give you this environment where over time we're democratizing massive scale compute. And so, you know, in, in not too long, like we're gonna be able to train GPT-4 level models in your own computer, right? Like um, in your own like laptop or whatever. Um, yeah, I don't know how far that is. I should like do the math on this, but I think it's probably like a decade or two at the most. Um, uh, and 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 that's kind of like that, that's sort of like what the what the scaling laws give you. Um, but the yeah, there, I, I think there's legitimate concerns around what regular structures might cause. But I think we're in a position where the safety concerns weren't them. And at the end of the day, we can like think of it as pumping the brake a little bit just to understand what we're building and then kind of revisit this, this kind of question. Um, and so I think like, I, I would encourage the people that are kind of super gung-ho on anyone should be able to build and train whatever model they, they want um, to really think through this. Uh, I think in, for most of the people that I've talked to about this over the last 10 years, um, they tend to not have thought it through enough. Um, and and, and uh, it's one of these things where like, it, it's just not an easy subject. You have to think through so many possible cases and possible circumstances to, to arrive at like a, at, at the kind of um, the, the the difficult the, the the difficulty of the problem. The problem is an extremely difficult one because of just how humanity progresses and um, the the outcomes for potential wars that might happen out of AI system, like relatively powerful AI systems that would get like rerouted and so on. Um, yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's an extremely complex problem in part because of the geopolitics of it. Um, do you, do you think there's almost like something like uh, potential uh, potential for differential development of AGI in the sense where we um, have positive capabilities, for example, to advance the good types of science without the bad types um, uh, or the risky kind of science and to use it for extraordinary good instead of uh, for kind of like existential risks? Um, yeah. Like what, 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 how do you see that yeah, kind of like unfold, like especially in the scientific context and um, more broadly yeah, over so the next few years? So, so I think it's both very possible and um, and and necessary, and I think we're like well on our way towards that. Um, I think we're not, you know, as far along as 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 to the part where we can kind of like have a reasonable, you know, we're not so far along this that we can discount the probability of uh, of wiping ourselves out yet. Um, but I think we've made an enormous amount of progress in the last few years. So. Um, most of the people working on these labs are like keenly aware of the problems and they're a lot more careful and thoughtful about what they're making now. That was not the case like five years ago or 10 years ago. Um, the, uh, we, we've done an enormous amount of progress on, on, on the theory of the field into actually figuring out how you build these systems and how, do you, how could you get to alignment and how would you build these, these kinds of structures and what kind of systems might work better than others. Um, uh, there's one particular system that I'm extremely excited about, which is the open agency architecture, um, which David came up with and is part of the, um, uh, I think it's posted in the alignment forum, um, and you know, people can go check it out there. Uh, but it's a way of thinking about AI systems, not as a singleton that is you know, a single AGI that thinks about everything, but instead it kind of um, decomposes what an AGI system would do into a bunch of separate components and modules where you use um, very rigorous um, uh, checking along the way using even um, you know formal methods like formal uh, verification and so on 
um, and human uh, oversight in a bunch of key parts to be able to um, then have a, a, high a high likelihood prediction of what the different parts are doing and, and you're not enabling kind of like a single AGI system to kind of develop goals and that are kind of uh, separate from humanity. So it's kind of like a way of building um, a, a, an AGI system out of a whole set of parts that are um, carefully mon monitored and so on. Um, yeah, I highly encourage people to go check that out. So I think those kinds of projects are going to be um, critical in, in kind of creating a, um, a safe outcome here. And I think a lot of groups are going to be pretty well aligned with, with them. I think, um, you know, when you think about like any of the people across this entire landscape, like everyone for the most part just wants a pretty great outcome for all of humanity. Uh, we, we got really lucky on this. I, I think people, people in the kind of at risk community tend to be um, perhaps extremely pessimistic because of the of the hardness of the problem. But I there's a massive amount of optimism here, which is like we got extremely lucky in, in when this happened. If this happened in the middle of like a massive Cold War, um, like imagine if this happened in, in like the 1970s, like th this would have been a, a total disaster. Like we would probably already wiped ourselves out. Um, and so the I think we're extremely lucky that we that it's happening at a moment where um, the whole world is a lot more reasonable. And it's kind of weird that like, you know, when you, when you think about the the dynamics of the system, um, this is all like the the the, the development of the stuff is extremely path dependent on a bunch of things that didn't have to happen this way. So the um, uh, the time at which you get like computers, the the very first computers, the the amount of like if, if we could like if we had invested into computing a few decades earlier, we could have further, been further along in certain areas. Um, maybe we've got, we've gotten these systems like 10 or 20 years before, um, or if we had done the opposite, uh, we, we had slowed down the development of, of this kind of technology, and these computing systems were like 20 or 30 years uh, later on, um, then maybe we might get like brain computer interfaces much faster than a AGI systems, so this would be like not much of a problem at all. Um, and so this is kind of like a, I think the biggest risk here comes from the fact that human brains and computers are so hard to interface right now. And, and this is where I think like um, I'm spending an increasing amount of my attention think, uh, in in, um, in brain computer interfaces because I think if we can create an opening here and and accelerate the um, the, the the technology development there, then uh, that that is like the best way to to both like augment humanity, but separately from that um, have a, a safe a AI outcome um, because if you if you can get to a point where just humans are start like interacting with these models very directly, um, then uh, as you're building these smart and smart AI systems, you're kind of grafting them onto the species as opposed to um, creating a wholly separate agent. Um, I'm, cu I'm yeah, curious, so like almost like, yeah, based on these insights and uh, based on kind of like your foresight in general, um, like experience, like how you almost like see, say the next 10, uh, 20 to like 50 years play out, maybe like with AGI and like fundamentally changing like how society operates, how science operates, like even like the, like if um, people even still have the concept of work or like how something like education might also change. Like I'm curious how you would paint the picture with almost like these different steps of like AI progress, like which for me is like mainly yeah. probably like AGI, like almost I like guess the base level and then like transformative AI just like thing, doing like every economical valuable task. And then of course like super intelligence almost like as its own camp of like doing it like a hundred times or a thousand yeah. times like better, quicker and more incomprehensible to us. Like how yeah, do you so see like <laughs> society shape up and like the systems to adapt, like like especially like yeah, in this kind of like short time frame. Yeah. Um so this is where uh though I have Thank you for the for the comment about my foresight. I, I I try hard to like think about the think about what's going on and try to think about think about the future. Um, however, the, the this is kind of like where, where the word singularity comes from. Uh, it's kind of like a like you know like a black hole singularity type environment or or kind of like the change is happening so fast that like you can't keep track of it. Um, it's extremely difficult to predict what's going to happen as as these transformative transformative technologies appear. Um, I think that it, and there's an enormous open space for possibility. I think like the the, the space is vastly, vastly larger than I think most, most people in the community think about um, of, of what's possible in like by 2050 or 2080 or something like that. Um, I think, uh, let me start with like the shorter term stuff because it's much easier to reason through and then maybe kind of think about like the later, later parts. 
um, I think in the short term, um, there, there's just this enormous optimistic outlook um, where uh, already the current models have done tremendously valuable science um, and have helped so many humans around, around the world do tremendously valuable science. So one, you know, a few great call-outs here. One is um, uh, AlphaFold. It's just such an amazing gift to the world. Uh, I, I also love that they have the, the, um, the, the, the uh, poetic, thoughtful um, uh, uh, idea of the two, like, do it over Christmas break and kind of like give it to the world as a Christmas present of like, hey, DeepMind just kind of like gave the world AlphaFold and like the, all of the proteins or, or like you know, a huge fraction of the proteins already kind of folded and so on. Like that's just such an amazingly cool uh, thing to do. And, it, and it's one of these things where um, that's kind of like Nobel Prize winning stuff, uh, honestly. Uh, and, and, and it's one of the things that I think as a human, we should be just so tremendously proud of, uh, of that achievement um, and sharing it with, uh, with the great people at, at DeepMind. Um, I think another such example is just all of the success that the LLMs have been able to do. So I think GPT-4, like OpenAI is supporting so many brilliant um, scientists and researchers around the world to do tons of tasks that are part of the scientific process. Everything from like parsing data better, reformatting data, um, thinking about some of the insights, evaluating ideas, finding possible references to things, and so on. Um, all of these models are like, not, of course, not good enough. Like they still hallucinate an enormous amount, and 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 there's all kinds of things that are like n not right yet. Um, but it's just kind of like scaling out GPT-4 and giving that to the world greatly has a, has already greatly accelerated science, and is is a phenomenal sort of like gift to gift to the world as well. Like um, I'm, I'm super excited and thankful to to all of the great people at OpenAI for like actually building that and and, and deploying it into the world and, and enabling it. A ton of people to like do this kind of kind of work faster. Um, you know, when when you think about the day to day of scientists, of most scientists in the world, a huge fraction of their time just goes into like munging uh, data from one format to another format um, and looking things up and so on. Like it, it, an unfortunately large amount of the time goes into that kind of task as opposed to thinking about potential problems. Um, I look forward to kind of like the near future where where we'll start having models that start doing like coming up with theories themselves um, that are fundamental, um, where kind of upon being presented with um, problems, they might suggest um, theories and experiments to try. And at, th at that point, it will be a great triumph of for humanity of being able to produce a, a, an intelligent system capable of doing science. Like that, that is going to be an amazing moment. Um, and it's going to kind of unlock a lot of possibilities downstream of that. Like you said, um, depending on how this goes, that level of intelligence starts sort of like replacing humans in, in a core foundational thing here. Um, there's, a, there's an old kind of description about this. Um, I think it's from Hans Moravec, uh, which is called the, maybe it's like lighter, it's probably Moravec. Um, it, it's this articulation of a landscape of, of possibilities of what, what humans can do. Think of like a large landscape with mountains and valleys and so on. And think of machine intelligence as like water in that landscape where it initially starts in some valleys and you know it starts the, the water level keeps rising as computing gets better and better and better the water level just keeps rising and rising and rising and just kind of continuing to consume certain areas that of of, of possibility that you know initially only humans could do and then later um uh, ais could do ironically kind of like art was kind of seen as kind of like one of the some of the pinnacles in the mountains and it has turned out to be like a Kind of like a mid-level plateau where, where now you know some of the generative AI stuff is just so amazingly artistic um, relative to like um, you know me as a uh, or, or many other human, you know kind of like the average human um, uh, and, and so and, and all kinds of like work that we thought was so extremely difficult for humans to do has actually turned out to be fairly easy for these models to do. Um, I think kind of the there's some specific points in that spectrum, some specific like mountains that will be um, tricky to to overcome, so, um, and and will have big big downstream implications. So, for example, um, the moment we have good enough robotics, um, good enough like ML systems to to run robotics, um, you know, humanoid robots um, or even swarms of drones and things like that well enough and to navigate in the world. 
um, that I think will start changing the planet uh, very quickly. I think it'll be like a very fast stepping point to like changing how society works. Um, I think because th at that point you start looking at not just kind of the knowledge work, but a lot of the manual work that humans do as being kind of um, on, on path of replacement. Um, yeah, I think I think you mentioned kind of the economic shift that we that we're going to undergo and and what to do about it. Um, this has been talked about for many, many, many decades. We've known that it was coming eventually. Um, uh, it, it has been slower than everyone thought, and now it's going to be faster than most people think. So it's one of these cases. It, it's like a typical S curve type thing where uh, initially a lot of people get really excited about the potential. It turns out that it's a lot harder and slower. Um, and then eventually we hit some like really fast tipping point where something starts happening very quickly. Um, we basically have to do really fast economic thinking and rewriting of economic systems in at a government scale um, before like massive disasters happen worldwide. Um, because it is very possible that the kind of like owners of capital, uh, uh, certain parts of capital, are going to be able to kind of just run the economy. And this is one of the areas where, like, uh, I'm very thankful that you know that people kind of write a lot about. Um, there's one good uh, essay from or, or set of ideas from Sam Altman called Moore's Law for Everything that it, that it starts pointing out how might we think about economic systems at that scale uh, when that kind of stuff starts happening. Uh, I think we need a lot more ideas like that. Uh, I think it's a great, great, um, great idea, great pathway. Uh, we need a lot more ideas like that that can help inform governments what they should do. Um, I don't know if the Future of Humanity Institute has done this, but, it is, but it's a sort of, this is a sort of study that, that, that FHI would have done um, and, and sort of had ready for governments to just pick off the shelf and, and start implementing. Um, I think this, is, this would be great work for a lot of economists to do right now. It's like think about um, what kind of economic policies are required in governments as these AI systems emerge um, that make sure that we're like in a well-aligned environment where as they start taking over most of what it, we think of as work today, um, we can kind of like move, uh, move humanity into either concentrating on the, or, or on the areas of like great value creation or separately just get to a spot where like you no longer need to work to survive. So, so I think like this is one of these things where um, our, our systems are so backward um, like our, our modern economic and government systems are just still so backward um, that we still kind of like, we live in this massive world of plentiful abundance and we still haven't figured out how to coordinate our systems so that like people don't go, don't go hungry around the world. Um, this is like very possible. It's just, you know, the fact that like we have built computers and jet aircraft and like <laughs> space probes and so on are like problems that are honestly vastly more complicated than the economic system problems. It's just that the economic system problems are so taboo to change and so difficult to change and they're so scary and risky to change. Talk about AI risk type, type of problems. If you kind of get the economics wrong or the governance wrong, you end up with like horrible disasters, right? I think of like the, um, the, uh, the Chinese famine in, in, uh, in, in like the, in, in the, um, around the time of like the, I think it was around the time of the Cultural Revolution or so, or like maybe um, before or after, but it was like this, terrible situation that came out of like broken economic policies and um, I think tens, tens of millions, tens of hundreds of millions of people died or something like that is an insane sort of outcome um, that happens if you kind of mess up the, the economics. And so I think like, you know, it's understandable why people are so resistant to these things being changed, but we're going to have to. Um, and so we have to like now figure out how to evolve the system quickly uh, to get to a spot where um, humans in general can live like really great lives um, without having to like work for it um, because that work is not going to be necessary anymore. Um, and so I think I think like this is one of these things where uh, it's fairly difficult to um, it's fairly difficult to talk about all this stuff uh, broadly because people come from such different different areas of knowledge that they haven't kind of like integrated that thinking. And especially at a government scale, where, you, where you're having public conversations with hundreds of millions or billions of people, um, it gets extremely difficult to talk about these kinds of issues. And so I think, like, um, though it's not commonly recognized, I think we have massive risks in the fact that our government systems 
aren't adequate with the technologies that we now have power over. And, and I think like that work in that area could be transformative as well. Uh, it's just kind of so difficult to change governments that, and so slow for good reason, um, that it's not likely to see that you know some new systems might might work fast enough. Um, yeah, maybe yeah. it's like a way. Yeah, go ahead. I'm, I'm I'm curious what like some of your intuitions are maybe like for potential solutions. Like of course there's like the whole space of network states, which I think especially like um, crypto uh, thinkers and people have. Um, of course, mass massively advanced. Like, do you think it's easier to like almost like start from scratch with alternative, better systems, or like also do you have specific intuitions for almost like refactoring, rewriting, say uh, how the U.S. or like bigger nations operate and adapt to kind of like these changes? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, th these are like highly complex systems where if you get something wrong, you can, you know, cause an enormous amount of harm. So it's understandable that people are very hesitant to change them. At the same time, it's areas where uh, great improvements will net tremendous value to to all of the people in that area, and then provide an example for many others. Um, I think that it's difficult to like. I, th I think we've learned through very hard earned lessons that fast revolutionary uh, government government change tends to leave things much worse off for a while before the same ideas can get implemented in better systems. So a good example of this is like the, you know, the, I always kind of sort of like love comparing the, the French Revolution and the American Revolution. Um, the American Revolution was like a much smaller change in the, in the overall scheme of things. It's not that the founders of the U.S. didn't think about all these other possibilities and weren't aware of like, the same kinds of things that the later on French counterparts were thinking about. It's just that they were a lot more scared about the harms that, they, that changing the systems too much could do. And they leveraged a lot of the um, uh, kind of history of failed experiments in the past to be much more careful about what changes to make. Um, unfortunately, the French Revolution was a much more volatile environment where both really great ideas were proposed, but you got into a position where a few people just managed to get gain control of power and ended up like completely debasing the revolutionary movement itself, co-opted the whole thing, and you know, committed like horrible atrocities in the name of um, in the name of the revolution. And and this has happened many times um, in history in many places. And so I think like we can't really evolve these things wholesale like that. I think we have to do this kind of gradual change. The problem here is 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 one of these temporal issues where like, you know, AGI is coming so soon, economic change is coming so soon. Um, we need to like be changing governments quickly and, and any kind of like delay system in the government to, to uh, adapt to change presents a risk. Um, so this is where I think we just have to like enable a lot more, more smaller scale experiments and get better at adapting the experiments that work uh, and propagating those faster. Um, this is another thing that I think like um, will be kind of like much more palatable to say Gen Xers and Millennials, and then it will be to um, to kind of like the Boomer generation, um, especially kind of in the in in the U.S. and in Europe, um, and and maybe so in in, in China as well. Um, I I don't know less about um, some of the other the other countries, but I think it's like highly necessary necessary work. Um, I think maybe the problem here is that we don't have um, good test environments. I think, I think we should be creating way better ways of testing these kinds of things at scale um, to see how they really work. I've always, you know, some idea that I've been like kicking around for a long time is like, what if we could build like a, like a large scale simulation test suite for economic systems that we try and get like extremely high fidelity um, renderings of, of, of large scale economies so that we can test new kinds of economic systems at various different scales um, and see whether things work at small scale, medium scales, and large scale. Uh, it's one of those examples where, like, you know, kind of like we, we got very scared of changing uh, uh, economic systems because of the, of the communism capitalism fight in the, in the 20th century. And it's one of those things where, like, in reality, capitalism has been, you know, a set of smaller systems that got, like, started evolving together. Uh, and they were kind of like, um, uh, it just broadly gets called capitalism, but in reality, it's like, a, you know, many different stages of it with many different like ideas that got like amalgamated and, and kind of improved. 
Um, and of course, communism had its own sort of like version um, of, of that same set of things. Um, but the, the reason capitalism ended up succeeding is that it works better at medium and large scales. And in reality, it doesn't work that well at small scales. Like if you, you know, if a group of friends tries to like charge each other for all kinds of interactions, like nickel and diming each other for like <laughs> hanging out, like it obviously like doesn't, doesn't work. Um, but it, it works fairly well at medium and, and, and massive scales. And, and communism was kind of the opposite. It worked really well in smaller and kind of small to medium scales where like, you know, you can kind of run fairly good communes and fairly good like small, um, small communities and maybe kind of like town, village, city type thing. Um, but they never figured out how to run like massive scale things at all uh, and, 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 and properly, um, properly build them. And so this is one of the things where like if you, if you had a, a, a good similar environment where you could like test out economic systems at lots of different scales, then you could like try like variants of things and experiment and then kind of have a good um, experimental loop to come up with new ideas, new, new structures and then implement them at scale. Um, I think like many governments would benefit tremendously from doing this. Um, but you know, it's the sort of thing where like everyone's, it's too taboo to like propose changing the economic structure that, that um, you know, people are like very scared of like doing it and, and, and there's like little funding for it and so on. Uh, I think maybe here this is where we need an impetus grants type program. Uh, maybe we need an impetus, impetus style grants program for um, new economic mechanisms in general, um, uh, and, and especially things that are testable, um, testable at scale. Uh, this is one of the things that I think is, is really exciting, exciting about WorldCoin and all the other UBI-oriented projects, um, being able to start experimenting with economic systems at that kind of scale is super, super cool. Um, and so, I, yeah, I'm pretty excited about like that range of things over the next five to ten years. Absolutely. Yeah. Maybe to close us off, I would be uh, keen to almost like switch back gears to decentralized science and curious of like for the audience of decent builders and decentralized science, like what would be some of your like advice or like things you would like to see build or like some of maybe small prototypes that people can um, start hacking on that you would be excited to see um, also maybe integrating with some of the other ideas you mentioned, which I think is like one of the powers, of course, um, of decentralized science, kind of this modularity. Maybe you have some last words for uh, the DSI audience. Yeah, totally. So um, maybe I'll give um, two, two categories of it. Um, one, I'll maybe mention a bunch of like really interesting um, uh, things that people are doing right now and, and, and experimenting with. And then second, I'll, I'll like point to a set of like, um, Kind of sources for inspiration. Um, so on the on the first part, um, I think things like making credit attribution um, an on-chain primitive would be pretty valuable. This is one of the things that we sort of discovered through the source code project a while back. Um, like just creating like credit attributions on-chain will be will be pretty valuable. Um, I think the second is um, better funding mechanisms for for R and D will be very helpful, and these can come in many flavors. So one that we haven't touched on very much so far in the conversation, but one that I'm just so deeply excited about is hyperserts. Um, hyperserts are a, an on-chain version of impact certificates, um, and also made by David, by the way, um, uh, who is, it, it, hyperserts is, gives you a, a, a tool chain, um, you know, a lot of us working on the, on the hyperserts project are super excited about like the tools that you can build around, around hyperserts. They're, they're extremely composable. You can do things like Proactive funding, you can do things like retroactive funding. Um, they just enable you to kind of um, split a credit distribution on chain, kind of like what I was describing before, but it gives you the ability to um, uh, think about all the claims in credit space and then make that a transferable asset. So it's not just the credit attribution on chain that you can like route m money to, it's also a transferable asset potentially. Um, and that means that you can start doing things like sending money back in time. Um, uh, I'll kind of like leave that as, a, as an interesting, uh, instead of explaining it here, I'll leave that as an interesting thing to talk about in the future or, um, or, or, or find it elsewhere. Um, I think things like, um, we sort of discovered a mechanism that's pretty interesting called, um, we currently call it impact evaluators, but this is name probably should change. Um, it's kind of a generalization of block rewards. Um, but if you can kind of route block rewards to a pool of um, actors that is all kind of trying to maximize some KPI, um, you can make some very simple on-chain structures to, to change a lot of things very quickly. Uh, so I think those kinds of things are like pretty exciting. Um, I think um, things like radical drips are pretty cool. So there's, there's another way of like doing like small composable value flows. Um, I think things like um, 
I'm pretty excited about a thing I'm starting to call like network capital or, or impact capital, where it's like you can, you're create, you can create investment funds in early R&D work or like other kinds of impact um, and, and make small groups, small funds that kind of mirror the, the venture capital structure. So venture capital has all kinds of funds at different scales, uh, you know, small seed funds to like individual angels to like larger VC funds to like fund of funds and pension funds and so on. If you can kind of like create that same kind of network oriented structure, but for um, impact uh, capital, um, that could be extremely, extremely valuable. So, so this might mean like, um, one of the key things to solve there is how do you have a notion of carry and impact ROI? Um, you know, how do, how do you have a, a structure where uh, all the people working on impact funding end up benefiting from the, the work that they're doing? This is one of the classic incentive problems in grant making, like the fact that grant makers don't actually um, get some of the impact or, or, or make profit. It just means that grant making is just like fraught as, as, a, as a field. Um, and so I think if you can create that kind of structure, um, it could lead to a much better kind of like early scale R&D type of pipeline. Um, and I think hypersource can, can be used as the, as the kind of like equivalent of, um, equivalent way of like propagating. Hypersource might give you the way of, of doing carry there. Um, I think there's a lot of other kind of, uh, so that's kind of a funding mechanisms wise. Uh, maybe I'll mention, um, uh, you, you sh people should be experimenting with like open access tools. So being able to kind of make all the artifacts on in science easily linkable and ratable. So papers, figures, um, data, um, the individual scientists and so on, like build, build like, there's a bunch of like centralized databases that have like done parts of this. Think of like Google Scholar or Mendeley and you know, other things like that. Um, being able to like make this a, a, an internet native thing that's internet routable will be way, way better. So you know, being able to have like something closer to Wikipedia for, for this sort of um, set of artifacts, um, that will give us a lot of ability to then create a bunch of other tools around those artifacts, right? So think of kind of like making the social network of science in a sense. Um, I think that could be could be super super valuable. Um, I think also mechanisms for peer review. So funding funding peer review at scale, um, I think is the way that we get rid of like the bad journals. So um, we don't yet have open access because there's these like extremely terrible um, leeches in the <laughs> scientific process that are kind of like holding back all the papers and just kind of um, the kind of like. It used to be, they used to say that it, it was distribution costs and we eliminated that with the internet. Um, it used to say, they used to say it's kind of like formatting and so on, but we have, <laughs> it's not really the case because scientists do all of that work themselves. Now the kind of like last argument is peer review, which is kind of <laughs> volunteer work um, uh, anyway. Um, I think replacing that, creating a better uh, peer review structure um, would, could be extremely, extremely valuable, um, especially one that you can fund at scale. So if, if we suddenly get peer review done through preprints instead of through journals, I think that could be like a, like a phenomenal, um, phenomenal outcome. Um, I think there's probably some other um, things there around thinking about the scientific process and, and like the artifacts of science. So the objects that are made, how they're like found and so on. Um, there's some interesting combinations with AI that I'll suggest. So um, I think just staying abreast of all the latest LM models and yeah, seeing abreast of all the changes and being able to start coupling them to environments for scientists to experiment, meaning like um, training models on like all of the insights in a particular field to then use it a, as, as a thinking tool that can help you develop new ideas. So being able to like ask the thing to um, suggest more, more uh, possible innovations or suggest types of experiments to, to try, or where you can you know, have an element that, that is trained on like all the papers or something um, to then like start probing it for interesting hypotheses or probing it for interesting experiments to try where um, there might be a way of like tapping into like the rest of the scientific um, community through this kind of tool that is you know, helping you think like the rest of the uh, scientists. Now, you have to worry about like tons of hallucinations, so humans will have to like keep weeding out all of the bad ideas, but I think that can you know, greatly accelerate um, science. And I think maybe like, so now I'm kind of turning to inspiration why I say, I, I you know, highly recommend people um, uh, try to get a, the, the broadest perspective they can. So one of the things that I found extremely valuable um, growing up, again, was kind of thinking about history and thinking about um, other 
you know, think like biology and um, as astronomy, like like knowing that the the universe is so you know, fourteen billion years old or or potentially more, um, is deeply um, world reframing. Um, knowing how life, we think life happened, and knowing how life is related, and knowing how cells work, and knowing how um, uh, how that entire system de has developed, is also massively worldview reframing. Um, understanding like different periods in history and how different communities and different different um, uh, cultures and civilizations tried to do certain kinds of things is is extremely eye opening. Um, thinking through what were the bottlenecks of those times, trying to think through what was problematic in that area in, in that time. Why why did like the Roman Republic never get to industrializing? Like that's an interesting question. Why did China in, in its many possible dynasties of, of being able to like get to that scale never did it? Why? Um, what were the blockers? Um, what were the, sort of like the kind of um, insights that um, led to the development of like the scientific revolution or or kind of like what were the social structures that had to change in order to get like broad publishing to happen and and the kind of appearance of like stronger peer review no circles and so on like that that's the kind of thing that if you study those kinds of developments in history then you can zoom back into the world today and th start looking at the world today with that kind of lens and think about some possible future set um that operates very differently um and so it'll, it'll sort of thinking about peer peers in the past and understanding those problems will help you understand and see the problems today and see possible solutions that could be built. Now, before you go out and build and spend a lot of time building anything, think through the leverage points. Like, what are the kinds of things that are smaller amounts of efforts that could translate to massive scale impact? And sort of prioritize your energy that way. Go go for things that will have, you know, higher, much higher likelihood chance of success. You don't, you know, um, simpler plans, simpler things that would then kind of translate into in, in ripple through lots of networks and lots of people to then cause massive scale impact. Um, yeah, so that's, I don't know, the kind of stuff that I would throw well, out. Uh, yeah. yeah, awesome advice. And I'm curious, like, maybe to end it off, if this specific almost like resource book or something in this direction that you would recommend, kind of like these side builders uh, to read. Yeah, so um, I, so I'll, make, I'll rattle off a few and maybe I'll start with like broadly inspirational ones and then um, maybe get more. Actually, I'll start with the more tactical ones, ones and then get broadly inspirational. So I think getting a good understanding of the history of various labs, uh, I think is very valuable. So um, pick up the Idea Factory, it's the story of Bell Labs. Uh, go look at, read that book, read the bibliography. Go look at um, all the Xerox Sparks ones, like um, Dealers of Lightning and How Xerox Fumble the Future, or you know things like that. Go look into the books about like Intel and um, all the tech companies, all the Silicon Valley, you can pick up a bunch of books that talk about that kind of time period. Um, also, things like Turing's Cathedral. It's a great book because it tells the story of the beginning of computing. Um, it tells the story of the building of the Joniac, which was like the, the uh, computer in, the, in Princeton built by von Neumann and a number of other people, um, and many other uh, machines as well. Um, so it gives you a feel for like the interconnected history of the beginning of computing. Um, there's similar kinds of stories that are the kind of like the um, that are in the in the realm of like, like the Memex or the the DKR, which is like the Dynamic Knowledge Repository, which is um, Engelbart's uh, um, work, to like um, all of the um, hypertext stuff that eventually led to the web and so on. Like, lots of really good ideas. Um, in there, and then kind of like more broadly inspiration, I would, I would kind of like lean towards things like David Deutsch and the beginning of infinity, fabric of reality, phenomenal books. Um, check out his TED talks as well; they're extremely, extremely valuable. Um, and then you know my personal favorite and probably most influential other human, or most influential human um, is Carl Sagan. Uh, I think Cosmos and was extremely formative for me, and uh, his books and just his. His voice and his message, um, I think, has been just tremendously, tremendously um, inspiring. And, and with that, I think, like, uh, throw in a lot of interesting art as well. So, you know, another favorite of mine is Melody Sheep, uh, who uh, actually got his start, like, by auto-tuning um, Carl Sagan and a number of other folks, uh, and now makes uh, extremely inspiring, uh, phenomenal, phenomenal art.
amazing. Thank you so much for this uh, fascinating conversation and your insights. Um, and excited to kind of like dive in even more deeply in future conversations. Um, awesome. Thank, thank you very much. I enjoyed this uh, so much. And, and thanks for a phenomenal uh, conversation. Thank you.